Hello and welcome to Jim's EV Adventures. Thank you for stopping by. Thank you for your time and trust. Over the past few months, I've worked with an organization called the Electrification Coalition. I'm a veteran. I'm a United States Air Force retired veteran, and I'm proud of that. And recently, I sent in an article to my local newspaper, and for the purpose of this video, I'm going to read that article verbatim. And I might embellish a few things here and there, and then I'm going to give you a follow-up. The title of the article is, Driving Electric is Good for America. As an Air Force veteran, I proudly serve this nation. I'm pro-Constitution, I'm well-read, and I know and understand history. I'm also very much in favor of a free and competitive market. And I drive electric for several reasons. To protect national security, to achieve energy security through independence from oil, to create American jobs in EV-related industries, and to foster economic prosperity. The U.S. military spends about $81 billion a year from taxpayers to protect oil infrastructure and transit routes. The need to constantly manage our relationship with OPEC countries that do not share our values diverts resources from more critical strategic threats. Our dependence on oil, their oil, puts countless service members' lives at risk and reinforces our reliance on a volatile and unstable global market with the potential to devastate the U.S. economy. The transition to an all-electric transportation system where power is made locally bolsters our nation's security, creates American jobs, and stabilizes fuel prices. Unfortunately, the U.S. auto industry has been losing ground to competitors around the world. The EV transition is a crucial opportunity to ensure secure supply chains for U.S. corporations and the military. Federal policies, such as the CHIPS Act and EV manufacturing tax incentives, are unleashing a wave of EV supply chain investments in critical minerals production and processing, battery manufacturing, battery recycling, and automobile manufacturing. The U.S. is sprinting to catch up with other countries, creating domestic job opportunities that veterans are well suited to fill. Florida has a significant EV ownership, number two in the nation. There were over 250,000 EVs on the road in Florida at the end of 2023, and over 9,000 public charging ports, yet we are lacking fast charging in rural areas. The federal government is providing funding to states to strategically develop EV charging infrastructure, including $198 million to the Florida Department of Transportation to support the development of EV charging stations along designated corridors. In the three years since the money was given to the Florida Department of Transportation, Florida has not spent any of it. I urge Florida lawmakers to break ground and start building EV chargers. This is not just about convenience for EV owners. Accessible to relying char reliable charging is a safety issue during hurricane evacuations. Florida can play a key role in advancing electric transportation. For example, the number of electric school buses in Florida is growing thanks to a grant and several rebate programs. The Clean School Bus Rebate Program awarded $30.4 million to six Florida school districts to purchase 98 electric buses. As of December 2024, Florida has 166 electric school buses on the road, with 229 more awarded and 72 on order. Diesel school buses average about 6 to 8 miles per gallon, so going electric will result in big fuel savings for local school districts, letting more of our local tax dollars go to education spending. On a national level, President Trump has nominated my former congressman and U.S. Army Colonel Michael Waltz to serve as the National Security Advisor. So, from one veteran to another, I ask Waltz to carefully examine the benefits of transitioning to EVs. Joining forces to develop EV infrastructure technologies will benefit both the military and the commercial market. It will also ensure the critical fossil fuels necessary to keep our military running in a crisis will be available without competition from the private sector. As the new administration begins its work, I hope advances in EV production and deployment are not seen as a red or blue issue, but as a red, white, and blue issue that everyone can support. If you're a veteran who is interested in a nonpartisan approach to EV policy, 
please consider adding your name to the Veterans for EVs sign-on letter directed to the new leadership in Washington. Support EV jobs, American manufacturing competitiveness, and defend our national security. So from the beaches of Volusia County, Florida, where I live, to the beaches of Kadena Air Base in Okinawa, Japan, it's time to drive electric. What I didn't have in this particular letter was something that I left out, and I'm going to add it here. Before you think drilling for more oil will solve our problem, you should know that upwards of 80% of the sweet crude we drill is exported because most of our refineries cannot use that type of oil. So we're left importing the majority of the oil that you use to fuel your internal combustion engine. Drill baby drill might sound like a good political rally, but it isn't founded in reality. The fact of the matter is, if you drive a gas or diesel powered vehicle, you are dependent on Canada, Mexico, Venezuela, Saudi Arabia, and half a dozen other OPEC countries to keep your car running. So drilling more oil will still not solve these problems. And I'm going to leave it there. Thank you for your time and trust. Thank you for stopping by. Thank you for listening to this article that I wrote to the local newspaper, this op-ed that I gave them. I'm going to continue to do this in the future. I want to tell you that for me, the issue about oil is not the fact that you're putting extra pollution in the air, which you are. You're really choking up the atmosphere with CO2 for every gallon of gas you, you burn. You're putting 19.5 pounds of CO2 into the atmosphere, and there are over a billion gallons of fuel dumped into the atmosphere every single day just in the United States alone. That's a lot of CO2 that we're dumping into the air. It's not just about that. I'm all for drilling for oil, but we need to use it in things that are not burnt. Burning oil is just something that is not smart anymore. Not only is it expensive, for you to go 300 miles, it's going to take about 10 gallons of gas, which is somewhere in the neighborhood of $25 to $30, depending on where you live in the country, and can be a lot more than that. But guess what? For that same $25 to $30, I can drive pretty close to 1,000 miles. So from an economic standpoint, it just makes sense to drive an EV. Not only that, all of the electricity that I put into my car is generated from American power. It's coming from natural gas that we get locally. It's even coming from coal. Very little, only about 5% of my power comes from coal. A good 25% of my power comes from renewables like solar, primarily solar, but just a little bit of wind as well, and some nuclear power very minimal nuclear power. So the amount of CO2 that I pump into the atmosphere from the fossil fuels that go into my car are less than a tenth of what you get over the same distance in your internal combustion engine car. You need to keep that in mind as well. But again, from a national security perspective, we don't have to depend on foreign oil to fill our refineries so we can refine gasoline any longer. I'm also for and very much in favor of transitioning our refineries to refine the oil that we do drill domestically. We need to end our reliance on OPEC and nations that support OPEC. It's America first. And I appreciate your time and trust. I thank you for stopping by and I'll see you out there somewhere or along that route from point A to point B. Take it easy everybody, see you all real soon.